Okay, so, uh, yeah, sorry for the delay. Good news, you were it not was... arrested by the police. <laughs> <laughs> was like, imagine he's getting arrested live. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, it would have been better if I'm getting arrested with a webcam on, right? <laughs> yeah, that, that's true. That's true. <laughs> no, no, not yet. I haven't done, at least that I know of, to be anything illegal. Never. Okay. Uh, <laughs> on record, yeah. you never did anything illegal, right? <laughs> exactly. Got it. <laughs> on record, nothing, never. Okay, so um, the next portion is going to be the EDW TI hooks. I'll speak uh, a bit into that. Uh, but in order to speak a bit about this, I'll uh, first have to start Brutal in this case because uh, uh, it's it's a funny uh, story as to how I actually landed into the EDW TI part, and that was because of one of my uh, customers who pointed out how uh, Brutal was not working with one of the EDRs that he was dealing with and I spent around two to three days to reverse that EDR which led me to reversing the deal of another EDR and then another and I spent up around I think one or two weeks reversing around six or seven EDRs. Uh, I was lucky that some of my uh, customers gave me access to the EDRs that they had and after reversing them I was able to uh, understand a lot of things that as to how the DLLs actually hook and how they look like and how to evade most of the things. So um, I'll, I'll probably start with Brute Retail right now and I'll come back to the ETW TI part uh, as we proceed because that's where it would lie if that's all fine with everyone. Sure thing. Cool. So yes, I'll close this. I'll go to the second part. Okay. So over here currently I have the Brute Retail's version 9.0.0.2. Uh, it's not the V1 uh, and uh, I, I think that some of you people might already know about this whereas for some of you, it might be new. So, I, and I have never done a live demo of this um, for anyone apart from the YouTube videos that I have. So, I thought it would be a good uh, way to showcase the different features and how it's different from a lot of existing C2s that are currently there. Um, uh, and I, I don't think there are any other commercial C2s in the market which are having a lot of those capabilities, right? So, that was the reason. And uh, it, it's a pretty funny thing as to how I started writing Brute Retail. I, I was basically in Mandiant at that point of time when. Uh, I, I was doing a lot of red teams using Cobalt Strike around, I think, two, two and a half years back. And um, we were, uh, there were uh, specific uh, scenarios where we were getting rejected by EDRs. And I, I there were specific scenarios which I wanted to avoid, which I thought that if I would have more, um, uh, I'd say, uh, exposure or not exactly exposure, uh, if I would have more uh, specific uh, access to the internals of Cobalt Strike, then it would have been very good. So uh, after I left Mandiant, I started writing this uh, tool. Uh, I started writing it from scratch, a lot of other things. And um, it, it started as a, out as a fun project. It was never meant to be commercial. But um, I, I decided to just commercialize it for the sake of IP before I joined CrowdStrike and I continued writing that tool and um, I started giving it uh, the, the trial versions to some of my friends to use it in their red team projects and that's how it basically uh, came to become uh, to commercialize itself. There was no other reason and it was totally a fun project as to how it started. So I'll just give you a quick uh, demo of that and I'll explain how the evasion features or uh, a lot of evasion features that are currently there and how they came into existence. So, uh, this is basically the uh, version of Brute Retail that was released, um, yeah, I think probably in uh, January. That was the last release of uh, Brute Retail. Um, that's last year, last month itself. And this is the V0.9.0.2, which has a, lot, uh, a simple bug fix. We have a different Discord channel where we uh, talk a lot about different evasions, feature requests, and a lot of other things If for those of you who might be interested on this. So when you execute Brutal for the first time, you are given three different options. The UI is specifically written in Golang itself. Sorry, not the UI. The uh, server is written in Golang, what you call as a team server. The UI is what we call as the commander, which is written in C++. And the payload itself is a mixture of C and assembly loader itself. So when you execute this, you have a few different options. The boomerang is a st standalone SOX proxy server. You have the retail mode for your C2 and then hyphen update option to check the updates. So right now, when you execute this, you would get a few set of options over here. I'll show you how uh, almost everything that you do in Brute Retail can be automated via the APIs of Brute Retail itself. So over here, I'll first simply start it as a normal team server that you would normally start. So hyphen A, admin, uh, that's your username, hyphen B, let's say for, sorry, hyphen P, that's your password. Let's say the password is admin itself. Hyphen SC for your certificate, which works totally with your Let's Encrypt search or something. Hyphen SK with key that you have. Hyphen H as to where you start your handler. 
in case of um, let's say some cobalt strike where you have 50050 port yeah it is a similar over here except over here i'll type 0.0.0.0, .0, .0, .0 colon 8443 in this case you can type anything that you want and uh, one more thing that you can type out over here is the hyphen e option which stands for com encryption key so whenever you send in data over the uh, via your payloads to the server right uh, even if it's a http tcp smb or anything else everything is custom encrypted using a mixture of aes 256 aes 128 and uh, rsa 1024 it's a custom algorithm that i wrote from scratch so that even if there are any network intrusion detection systems like for example bro zeek or fire uh, nx or something similar then you would be able to evade that as well because there are no normal strings in that so uh, and hyphen e and i will specify the password let's say the password is abcd123 to encrypt the post request if you don't specify hyphen e as you can see it will state you that if you don't specify that however it will simply uh, dynamically generate a key because all the keys that you all the post request that is being sent out is always going to be encrypted once you execute that we'll go to the commander that we have and this is how the ui would look like i'll log into uh, the ui and this is how the ui looks like which is written in c plus plus we we'll quickly start a listener and um, when we start a listener a few things will be automatically added because i am a pretty <laughs> lazy person and i like to autofill a lot of things as much as possible i don't like to uh, do things again and over and over again which can be automated so over here i have a listener name i have a bind host in which you want to bind the listener to on which specific um, internal port over here i'll keep this as this specific one which is basically belonging to my uh, vmware uh, any number you can specify any number of rotational IP addresses, host, fronted host, AWS redirectors over here. This is where your payload will connect back to. If you have three, four, five, ten, fifteen different redirectors, then all of these, then your payload will try to connect to each of them randomly, like either first one, then the second one, maybe the eighth one, maybe the tenth uh, host over here, and so on. So you can add as many fronted domains, as many um, AWS redirectors, IP addresses, or your domain names over here. For the time being, I'll just keep it as same because I'm doing that locally. The port over here, the user agent, any extra headers in case you are doing domain fronting, you can add any other host headers that you want over here. Uh, for example, let's say I'll type, uh, let's say, um, uh, let's say referer space Microsoft.com. You can add more headers that you want over here. For example, if you want to add, let's say, the host header, then you can type over here as test.azureedge.net or something like that. You can add your malleable post data over here. You can uh, click on the plus option. You can type, let's say you want to add a JSON profile, right? For example. So this is where what will get prepended to your post request. So curly braces, double quotes, let's say for example, channel, uh, double quotes, colon, double quotes. And over here, double quotes, curly braces. Okay. And this is how your post request will actually look like. So you can embed your actual data that is going to be sent via your payload. We call our payloads as badgers. Uh, basically, uh, it's a famous ter term that came from Honey Badgers. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you know, but Honey Badger is pretty uh, one of the craziest animals in the animal kingdom that is there, and that's how the name originated. So we have uh, Badgers. Basically, this is what the Badgers post request would look like uh, as to how where it will be embedded. We can add any number of URIs that you want. For example, test. Uh, let's say, for example, uh, login or let's say bootstrap or any URI that you want. Uh, any length of URI that you want as well. Currently, it's limited to Windows itself. We are still working on the Linux part. The SSL, whether you want to enable it or not. And then we have a common auth and a one-time auth option. So when I was doing my red team engagements back in Mandiant, one of the things that we faced was whenever we execute a specific, um, let's say we uh, fish a specific, let's say I'm going to fish 10 different users, right? And out of those 10 different uh, users, let's say five of them executed the payload. And out of those five of them, maybe let's say two of them got a bit suspicious and they reported your payload to the blue team. Now the blue team will come down, download the payload. Uh, maybe it would be a Word macro or Excel macro or maybe it's a HTA or something else in that case, even an MSI payload as well. They'll take that back to the VM and execute that over and over again to see what exactly is happening. I wanted to avoid that altogether. So I wanted to make sure that if a payload connects for the first time, there should be an option that the payload should not be able to connect back again if it is killed and executed again. That is where the one-time auth comes into picture. So your payload works like a legitimate uh, web server and client request itself. So your payload, uh, which is written in C, it will send um, an initial request to your server and the, uh, the initial request will be encrypted and it will contain a unique authentication key, which is what you type over here. 
if you use a common auth in that case what happens is that the payload sends back a encrypted key the server will decrypt that validate the key if the key is valid and if the server contains that key it will allow the payload to authenticate but however let's say and it will return back a token in that case however if you're using a one-time auth then the server will do the authentication part in the same manner however what the server will do is that once it has authenticated it will delete that key from the server so that if the payload is executed again the server does not have that key anymore and your payload will not be able to authenticate which means if a blue team tries to execute the same payload over and over again you won't see that in your payload tab that you have over here which is normally not the case with cobalt strike a lot of people who might have used cobalt strike they would know that if a blue team gets their hand on uh, the payload then they would be able to execute them over and over and over again into their environment and you would have that many beacons over here which is what something i wanted to avoid that is truly a so nice you, feature yeah so um, yeah that was basically something that i came out of experience because on one of the engagements where i saw that one of the blue team was continuously executing the payload over and over and over again and it was DDoSing our server with around, um, I would say, 10, 20, 30 different beacons, and it was being uh, hard for us to work at the same time. So that was the reason why I implemented this specific feature. And if you're using one time auth, you can just let the uh, server add the uh, keys for you. If you want, let's if you want to, let's say, create 10 different phishing payloads, click on 10, and it will uh, create 10 different unique authentication keys for that. For the time being, I'll select a common auth, and over here I'll type create a random set of authentication keys so that will create one authentication key and uh, the other option over here is die if the c2 is inaccessible which means if the payload is let's say unable to connect to the server then i don't want it to connect over and over and over again which will create your which will basically create uh, let's say your uh, an alert for your network detection team that something is basically trying to connect to a server which is not accessible. So you can simply select that so that if it is unable to connect for the first time, it will simply kill itself and not execute over again. I click on the save option. I have our payload, I uh, have our uh, listener started. Over here, if you just click on this specific portion, you will be able to see the whole server's configuration as you can see over here, including the listener configuration and a lot of other things. Your PS exec configuration when you try to move laterally, the server bind that how many users are active and all of these other things if the webhook is enabled and a lot of these things so you this is actually nothing but your c2 profile itself and that's basically what you can use to automate the execution of all of this and there's one more thing before we proceed is that whenever you create a listener right a payload profile if you go here to the c4 profiler and if you click on the payload profiler a profile will automatically be created now, using this profile, you can generate your own x64 or x86 payloads or the hex, bin, exe, blob uh, of your shell code, your DLL service or a PowerShell payload can be created in that case. And over here, basically your URIs and all a lot of other things. Now, the best part about this is that you can actually use this configuration to directly either move laterally and execute a payload into a target host without dropping anything to disk or you can execute a similar payload into a target process again without dropping anything to disk by just specifying the name of your payload configuration. I'll show how this can be done for HTTP, SMB or even TCP payloads in that case. So for the timing, what I'll do is I'll show you how this, can, this whole process can be automated. So this is how the JSON profile would look like. So I'll first uh, kill this server that we have over here so that I can show you how this process can be automated. And I'll close this. I'll go back here. I'll close this as well. And uh, as well, and I'll clean up every other logs that are available because there are log directories that are created for everything that you do. And let me just switch it out over here. And if I open up, let's say, let me just open it in code itself. If I open up a configuration file that I have over here, just bear, yeah. You can see we have a JSON configuration and uh, you can see that we have a listener which is uh, specifying that the listener name is JSON C2 which uses your JSON configuration, your URIs and a lot of other things over here. We also have an XML profile over here which you can see with all the XML configuration. We have the payload configuration for your SMB and TCP payloads in this case and the authentication keys, what name pipes you can use and all of these can be uh, modified on the fly. Your PS exec configuration as well, which is basically uh, a service that you can dynamically create and you can show how it would look like in a real life scenario. Uh, whenever, let's say, a blue team tries to enumerate all the services installed on a target host. 
your um, object files that you can register, that's your BOFs that you can execute. So we have this register OBJ, something similar to your aggressor scripting, except that it is a bit easier to understand since it's in JSON. So you can specify your object file and a name over here so that whenever you execute this, your object file will be executed. That is going to be your BOF file. Similarly for x86 BOFs that you have over here, your c -sharp codes that you want to execute uh, using a specific command uh, in your uh, C2, uh, that will be in a target process. If you want to execute a c -sharp code into your own process, you can use the register PE inline command. If you want to uh, reflect a DLL into a target process, you can use the register underscore DLL command to register that DLL as an internal command. And whenever you type, let's say, help space box reflect or help space monologue, it will return you the specific information into the help screen that you see over there. And if you want to enable a webhook, you can add a webhook for your reporting and other tasks as well in this case. So over here, I'll use this profile, which will automatically add these payload configurations that you see over here, uh, the payload profiles and these listeners as well. We are also adding a specific set of credentials, which can later on be converted to Windows tokens. And all of these can be added from the GUI as well. It to it's totally up to the user whether they want to add it via the GUI or via the command line interface. And we also have auto run so that whenever the payload connects, it will automatically execute whatever commands that you have typed out over here. So I'll go back, I'll type root retail Linux hyphen retail hyphen C, and I'll specify the configuration file uh, that we have. And you can see that it's basically specifying all the information. It has added three users as per our configuration file, one credential, two commands to auto run, restore two listeners loaded for pay, uh, four payload configurations and a lot of different config uh, uh, commands from the config file itself. So now if I execute the graphical user interface, you would see this is what we have over here, two listeners up and running. If I go here, take a look at auto runs, you can see the child process and the sleep. There is no jitter that has been configured, but you can configure jitter with sleep 60, 40 or something like that, that you want. And I'll simply create a payload right now. Over here, I'll create an exe. And I'll save this to the documents directory that we have over here. I'll go back over here. I'll go to the second VM that we have. Just out of curiosity, by default, do you have any kind of obfuscation when you generate the exe or is pretty much like plain exe? Yes, so uh, that's actually a pretty good question. And the best part is that uh, whenever you build the exe, right, uh, what's actually happening in the backend is there's a shell code and the shell code is modified every time on the fly as well as basically whenever the shell code, the shell code will in turn go and execute your reflective DLL into your own process itself. And the reflective DLL is basically encrypted with RC4 itself. So it's almost impossible for anyone to identify what the actual payload is going to get executed. And also, once it's in memory, the whole Rx region which gets allocated will also get hidden. Similarly, uh, if there are any other, all the P, unlike the St Stephen Fuse reflective loader where the whole P was allocated into a single region, that is not the case with root retail because every region is, for example, your uh, R region of your uh, reflective DLL will be allocated into the read-only region. Similarly, with RW region, your global region, your... So all of these sections are properly bifurcated and the RX region itself is encrypted and it is dynamically changing every time using ROB gadgets. So... I'll show you how that works in a sec. First, um, I have Defender onto this host. I have disabled um, uh, internet onto this host uh, so that I do not have any um, internet connectivity on this. Uh, as you can see, so I do not have any internet connectivity on this host. I have the rest of the things enabled. And if I execute this, there are a minimalistic to very low set of, I would say, um, uh, I, I won't even say low. I, I, I don't think there are any specific detections um, onto, onto the signatures of brute retail for the time being. And this is how you can see uh, the uh, information over here for the uh, payload that has been connected back. Now you saw that it took around 10 to 15 seconds to execute that. And the reason for that is because uh, brute retail contains a specific set of, sh a specific shell code, which I call as checkmate. So what checkmate does is that one of the things that I was, so one of my customers came back to me in December saying that he was working alongside Sophos and Sophos was specifically, uh, the payload was specifically crashing onto that payload. And one of the things that I saw was that the second DLL, as I told you earlier, that uh, your EDRs can load their own DLLs before anything. And Sophos was specifically hooking the ETW using uh, the set NT information process uh, API call 
and it was also um, loading its own DLL as the secondary DLL instead of kernel 30 dot DLL. So if my uh, shell code tries to dynamically find out the kernel 32 in memory and execute them, and if it tries to find out whatever the second DLL was loaded, it will directly clash before because the second DLL will be the Sophos DLL itself. So I spent some time reverse engineering and that's how I was able to find out how Sophos is doing the ETW TI hooks in this case, especially for the syscall. Now it's different with every other EDR. For example, Sentinel-1 does everything in kernel mode. Your 40 EDR also and CloudStrike does everything in the kernel mode itself. However, there are some other uh, EDRs which do these into the user land itself. And that's when I spent some time reversing and trying to understand how things work. And I came up with this specific code which can actually be used to hook your syscalls itself. So before I go to, back to the Badger's code itself and, and explain the other functions or the vision tactics, let me show you how this code will work. Again, all of this is again open source and it's already there onto my GitHub profile itself. So right now I have this ETWTI mod function, which I'm not executing it for the time being. So some portion of this code was heavily, um, I would say, so this code that I'm showing you right now, this was heavily researched by Alex Inoscu back in 2015, where he presented in the RECon at that point of time. It's a pretty good video if anyone wants, and you can probably search the RECon video of Alex Inoscu on ETWTI and process instrumentation, and you would get a lot of more information from what I'm going to say, you, say over here right now. So over here, what I'm simply doing is I'm simply um, <clears throat> specifying a few set of structures. I'm converting a random PID. It's basically a random integer value just to show how this would work uh, over here. And I am uh, passing that along to this client ID structure that I have over here. And I'm sending that to NT process API call, which will in turn call my NT open process syscall itself, that whatever the syscall for that would be. And uh, before I uh, enable uh, this specific hook that I have, let me just execute this with uh, commenting out this specific portion and see how it looks like in memory. So I have a simple make file over here and let me just compile this. I'll just type make and it's fine if you see these many errors. Uh, I've just not typecasted a lot of things. That is the reason why you are seeing it. So let me go back to my first system where I have the debugger up and running. And let me open the ETWTI uh, code that I have over there. That would be into the this directory. Perfect. So now I'll simply go to the symbols directly, NTDLL. I'll type NT open process and I'll add a breakpoint over here. Now as soon as I click on the uh, 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 run button, you can see that we have this specific portion. Uh, the RCX value is being moved to R10 which is going to be our R6 is going to be our edge process. That is our handle to a process. And since it is invalid handle value, invalid handle value stands for one, which is nothing but your current process itself. So you should see 0x FF over here. So if I right click, follow it in dumb, we can see uh, 0x FF FF over here itself. The next value is going to be process all access, which is going to be uh, this specific value after it has been odd. That will be in RDX. And finally, we have the third and the fourth value in the R8 and R9 register. And our R8 over here, as you can see, is nothing but empty. So if I right click, follow it in dumb, you will see that it's totally empty, except apart from that it is being initialized. And then we have the CID, which is going to be our R9 register. So if I right click, follow it in dump, you would see this. You will also see the value over here, that is 20824, which is your hex value for 2084 itself. That's what you are seeing over here. So that's basically the value that you can see over here itself, which has been converted to your unique process. So now uh, when you execute this specific uh, portion of the code, you can simply go one down one by one and you would be able to execute this call in this case, which is the value of 26. But however, let's see what happens over here. If I, if I click on the next part after I execute the syscall, it simply comes to return and then it will go back to executing our own code. I can see that our return value is uh, invalid. It's giving us that status invalid CID. That's our client ID, which is our invalid process handle itself. So that's totally fine because we have actually entered an invalid process ID in this case. But the whole point of showing this over here was that this, after executing the syscall, our ret instruction is going to be executed, which will go back to our user code. But if we enable this portion of the code, let me enable this function. So what this does is that it will simply initialize the process instrumentation callback structure. And inside this structure, it will add the callback value to your hooked callback function that I have. I have a small function over here in assembly, which I'll explain in a bit. 
After that, I'm using the entry set information uh, process over here. Now, this is what Sophos was doing in its case, was that it was simply enabling this, and it was continue. It was not hooking the syscalls directly. However, it was simply monitoring which syscall uh, is being executed, and it was sending that back to its cloud interface uh, onto uh, the web itself. So over here, as you can see, we have the handle over here that we are specifying that modify the information into the current process. We're specifying that the value is going to be process instrumentation callback, which is going to be the of the value 0x28, which is uh, 40 in uh, numeric. We are specifying the structure over here and the size of our uh, structure. So when I set this up, and if I continue to uh, call the NT uh, open process, as soon as the syscall is executed, it will return back to our hooked callback, which is going to be this uh, va function. It will simply push the RCX and RDX to stack. It will take whatever is the value at the R10 register and subtract minus 10 and move that to the RDX register itself. So I'll show you how this works because this actual value that you have over here in the R10 register will be the function pointer of the function that you executed, your NT API. And if you subtract 10, you will reach the syscall over there. And then we will simply call the syscall itself. And if you remember, the RCX will be the first argument. RDX is the second argument. So when we call hunt syscall over here, the RCX will be the first argument. And the RDX, that is our red syscall, is going to be the second argument. And it will simply return that a syscall has been detected. What is the return address and what is the syscall value in this case? Which basically means that your syscall is now hooked via process instrumentation and you would be able to see what exactly is being executed in this case. So if I, let's say, make this again, if I go back to my code and let me um, see whether the breakpoint is already added over here. Yep. And you can see that just before the breakpoint is going to be hit, I go to syscall and as soon as I call the syscall, it will not go to red after that. This is where the fun starts. As soon as I click on the next button, you would see that it is being redirected to the code. Basically, it means that your syscall is now hooked and is being redirected to the code which I had added up over here. This is how your user land syscall hooking would look like. Push RCX, push RDX register, which is what you can see over here. We are pushing the RCX because we are saving them to stack. The RCX, we are saving that to stack. We have the on the R10 register, as you can see, we have the address of D234, which is what if we follow it in this assembler, you would see it's our red instruction. So if we subtract 10, we should get the value 26, which we have over here. So if I go back to our instruction pointer, and if I subtract this, as you can see over here, R10, that is basically this value, uh, that's our red value, minus 10, basically brings us to the D224 uh, value, the actual value is 000026, which is going to be your syscall. So we are moving that to RDX, which you can see over here. Our RDX has that value over there. We are, then we are simply going back and calling our main function, which is our hunt syscall in this case. And finally, we are back to our hunt syscall. That is going to be this specific function that we have, which will in turn just print our instruction and simply return. That's basically, it's going to print our syscall which was rejected and the return address that is going to be our C3 address. That's our C2 return address. So if I just, as you can see over here, the callback was added. If I keep on doing this, let me just uh, go to, uh, let me just go to this printf portion over here, go to write and uh, return pop 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 red and finally we have reached over here back to our original code and yeah it will let me execute it till return so that we are able to see our uh, syscall hooked instructions in this case as you can see it has basically found out that our written address is basically this this is basically because that is basically relying into our current uh, current function itself and this is basically going to be our syscall so what the EDR does is that it will check what the syscall was executed it will also check what is the return address and if this return address is belonging to any region apart from a legitimate executable region itself for example if it's a uh, memory a manually allocated rx region by a user then it will simply go and kill the process itself because this region should be a region which is belonging to your nt dll because it is not um, um, it is not normal for a process to directly call a syscall or directly call an nt api itself 
So in this case, if you're going to call an NT API and if the NT API is simply hooked or if your process instrumentation is also hooked, even if you're directly calling the syscall itself, uh, then it will simply go down return. If you're calling direct syscall, indirect syscall, it doesn't matter. All of them can get hooked by the user land in this manner. And the reason, if the return address is something within your manually allocated Rx region by either NT allocate virtual memory or virtual uh, allocate um, API call, then the uh, then your um, EDR will itself go ahead and kill that specific process using the user land hook that it has added. So one of the easiest ways to avoid the whole hook in this case is by either adding your own hook like I did over here or simply using null which means the existing uh, user land instructions in that case will be overwritten and there are no more user land ETW TI hooks in this case. Now this is specific to your process instrumentation. Things are different when it comes to for example uh, the kernel mode hooks uh, which uh, the Sentinel-1 uh, uh, actually uses. But using this, it's not only useful for understanding and evading the EDR, but also if you're trying to reverse any specific, let's say, uh, payloads for, or any, uh, let's say, um, any tools from any um, uh, hunted uh, APT groups or threat actors, you would also be able to see which uh, syscall they're actually executing in the backend by hooking their um, uh, specific uh, uh, executables or shell code in memory in that case. So does this EWTI uh, make sense? I mean, the whole portion is that is that clear? I mean, any doubts on this specific part? So far, so good for me. Any question in the chat? I am not using. Yeah, I just saw the LLVM obfuscation. Um, uh, yeah, so yeah, I'll just paste the Discord, uh, the link for Brute Retail as well. I just saw the comments. And yeah, I'm not doing any LLVM obfuscation for the time being. LLVM is pretty hard to implement, I would say. It's not easy and you end up writing a lot of um, instructions and syscalls of your own, which I have tried at one point of time, but it is too much work, so I stopped doing that. And if you actually end up implement, uh, implementing LLVM, you would face a lot of other restrictions in that case where you have to... Um, uh, uh, where you might not be able to access a lot of extra. For example, I was writing LLVM code around some time back where I saw that where I saw that whenever you execute LLVM, you were, I was not able to uh, access a specific set of drives because I was limited as to what I can uh, access from the uh, virtually implemented, um, um, I'd say, instructions that I had allocated. It's pretty hard. It's not, I would say, easy to implement. That's the reason why I'm trying. There might, I haven't seen um a specific um, i would say proper i'm yet to see uh, any sp I, I mean i might be wrong in that case but i ha i'm yet to see a properly implemented llvm payload in this case so I, I might be wrong i mean if there are any then feel free to uh, correct me in this case but yeah any doubts any queries still now before we proceed looks good to me okay so all of this is heavily documented on uh, my blogs um just in case if someone wants to Take a look back as to how this was implemented. If you go back to brutal.com and if you take a look at the uh, v release v0.8, and if you scroll down, and if you take a look at one of my older posts of uh, executing position independent shell code, you would see the whole uh, PIC that I uh, uh, informed a few uh, minutes back about uh, the one thing that I explained. You have all the information over here and all the information on the ETWTI hooking and everything over here as well as to how they can be worded in that case. So now that specifically on the EDW TI part, coming back to Brutal, we have access to our payload. Now you can see that our child process was also set. Our sleep command was also set. We can check uh, what commands that we execute over here. And you can see the jitterun percentage can also be added. Currently I have set it to one. You can see on the left hand side bottom whether it's connecting back or not. Now uh, if I just type help, you would see more than probably I think 120 or 125 commands, all of which are getting executed via Windows API uh, and syscall itself uh, that are being executed. All of these are heavily documented onto the website. But however, for the timing, what we are going to do is we are going to use these two functions. One of the things that I always wanted when I was doing a red team uh, was the ability to modify the process injection technique on the fly. And one more option was to return what is a syscall onto my current host to the user itself, which can be done using Brutal. Since because it uh, Brutal uses pure syscalls to execute the shell code to allocate the memory and everything, 
and unlike it doesn't uh, it also it doesn't use the default uh, technique i mean it doesn't just go to the function pointer and try to extract the syscall value what brutal does it that if there are any hooked instructions right because a lot of uh, edrs for example crowdstrike implements its own umppc when i was in crowdstrike i saw that a lot of for a lot of time uh, i saw in sentinel one that they are implementing tons and tons of user land hook a few of my tweets which you might have seen before uh, which i tweeted a few days back So they implement a tons and tons of user land hooks where as soon as you call the syscall, the syscall value itself is overwritten, so you cannot read the syscall. So you end up either reading the ntdll dot dll from disk, or you end up getting caught. If you read the ntdll dot dll from disk, then one thing that you are actually doing is basically you will have to use either the open nt open file or nt create file API call in this case. But what happens when even they are hooked in that case? you won't be able to do uh, because if those api calls are already hooked any time you try to do a read ntdl or dll you are bound to get caught in that case so what i wanted to avoid was i wrote the a debugger which i informed about a few minutes earlier that is checkmate the debugger is purely written in assembly and what that does is that it will simply try to find out the jump instructions of the edr and will try to walk the jump instruction so to give you a quick example as to how the jump instruction would look like i have a simple um, let me open any file let me just open let's say um, let me go to c windows C's system 32 cm.exe i'll go to symbols and i'll right click and load a library so in a real life scenario this library will be loaded by the kernel itself so uh, uh, not this library any library so i have a althook.dll and i'll just load this up and right now if i go to let's say kernel 32 and if i search for get proc address over here sorry not get proc address get module handle you would see that get module handle is currently overwritten you can see that a different value is being moved to rax and the value is jumping to rax which is not the original instruction so over here uh, if i just follow this instruction over here to jump rax this is what your edrs also do they will simply jump to the specific address and then they will end up calling something else in this case so what the checkmate the code in my blue turtle does is that it will simply walk through each of the instructions that you see over here and it will try to find out where the syscall is actually hidden into the process memory of since uh, the process is my own i have full access to each and every region of the process until unless it is actually protected by page guard which is sometimes that sentinel one does so i'll first um, uh, remove all the page guards that are implemented onto my code i'll try to walk uh, the jump instructions and i will try to find out the op code where my syscall instructions will be stored and then I, my brutetel's code will change the current instruction pointer to the jump instructions in the dll of the edr itself and then the the syscall will continue executing which means that brutetel will not itself execute any syscall it will actually ask the edr's dll itself to execute uh, to continue the instructions of executing the syscall itself which means there is hardly any chance of going to get uh, going of being detected in that case that's how the brutetel syscalls work and that's the reason why it is able to evade almost everything till date especially in memory so what we are going to do right now is we are going to use syscalls to uh, inject our payload into a target process using the c4 profiles and this technique over here so i'll type set underscore malloc if you just type set uh, let's say help space set underscore malloc these are the different memory allocation technique that brutetel supports so i'll type set underscore malloc and i'll use let's say the four option which is going to be nt allocate virtual memory syscall over here as you can see and i'll type help space set underscore threadx and i'll type set underscore threadx to let's say for example i'll use two over here Oh, no no not two that's nt api i'll select a 9 which is going to be syscall in this case and my process uh, execution technique has also been set i can type ps to change the parent processes over here and if i type let's say ps grep let's say i'll search for explorer because i am a bit of a lazy person so i'll just search the pid over here or i can directly just type explorer over here to search the explorer itself as you can see the pid and everything but since i have the pid over here that is 4272 let me type set underscore parent 4272 over here i'll enable dll blocking in this case and all the logs are currently stored over here itself as you can take a look at that right click view you can be able to you will be able to see all the logs of everything that we executed so if i type cls it doesn't mean that uh, it will be uh, stopped from uh, the logs are gone in that case 
So once we have that over here, uh, I'll just type run notepad.exe. I can also start a suspended process, which I have not currently for the time being, as you can see. And our, our notepad has been started into this PID. The spoof PPID should be 4272 and I'll type PC inject command. So if you take a look at the help, it can take a process ID. It can take a payload configuration over here and it will allow me to, uh, it will basically execute that payload into a target process directly. That's basically the shell code of the, or the reflective dealer of the, of the configuration that you have given. So I'll select auto JSON C2 in this case. So I'll type PC inject the process ID auto hyphen JSON hyphen C2. And if I haven't uh, typed anything wrong, then I should get a connection back from notepad.exe using the syscalls if uh, Defender has not killed my target process. Let me just go and verify that over here. Yeah, my notepad is still running. Let me open a process hacker. And just to validate that the parent process ID has been changed. You can see the parent process ID has been changed. The DLL blocking is also enabled in this case. If I go back, yeah, I, as you can see, we have a connection back from notepad.exe. I will exit my original badgers process and I'll open this one, which is my notepad.exe. I'll go back, I'll open up notepad, I'll go to the memory section. And normally I should have an R RX region over here. So if I scroll down, you can see there is one RX region. If I refresh it, it will take a few seconds. Yeah, as you can see, it's gone right now. There are no more RX regions at all in this case. So the whole uh, read, write, read, uh, uh, read and execute region itself is hidden. However, if I go back and if I type, let's say, set, uh, let's say if I type sleep zero, only then the RX region will be visible. As you can see, this is basically the code. If I go back, if I type, let's say, sleep one again the whole region again as you can see uh, if i refresh the rx region is gone and the whole region is continuously changing so this portion of the code was uh, heavily inspired from the one that was written by uh, Stephen hudson so where basically he wrote foliage quite some time back i um, uh, uh, i basically t took that code i modified it because it was using it was executing a lot of uh, rob gadgets on stack where it uh, executed nt protect virtual mem so basically what the code does is that the rx region will create a new thread but before it creates a new thread it will allocate a specific set of instructions on stack which needs to be executed and it will also disable the control flow guard in that case for those specific regions and then it will go to sleep as soon as it goes to sleep the actual code the actual thread that you have created which contains the rob gadgets in your q user apc they will get executed. So in case of the code with that Austin Hudson had, had written, the, it was using the NT API call. So I had to end up modifying that to use syscalls itself because if I use NT API call, they are bound to get caught in that case. So I replace them, replace them with syscalls itself. And now whenever they are sleeping, they will execute a bunch of syscalls to hide the original RW region to convert that to convert the original RX region to RW, encrypt that RW region with a random key, which is why you are seeing that the instructions are changing every time over here. Once the sleep time is complete, it will again convert that R. It will decrypt that RW region, convert that RW to RX, and then it will pass on the uh, uh, thread back to, or basically the uh, context back to the main thread itself, which will then continue to execute in this case. So basically, you have a payload which is not easily detectable in memory in this case, unlike any other uh, C2. I think that's already there. And once that is there, you can simply go ahead and execute tons and tons of different commands. For example, you can use the camouflage command if you're interested in phishing. For example, something like this and it will prompt the user to enter a username and password in this manner. Something you can actually use for phishing, which I have used a couple of times and I have found them to be pretty useful. It also patches your AMSI and ETW at the same time. Similarly, if you want to, let's say, um, uh, perform any kind of keylogger, you can use the keylogger technique. If you want to perform any kind of memory dump, you can use the memory dump, clipboard dumping technique. If you want to execute a C sharp tool in memory, you can either use the added uh, tools, which if you remember earlier, if I go to the JSON profile, uh, sorry, that's back over here. If you remember, we added, uh, yeah, if you remember, we added the, uh, 
uh, seed belt and the other BOFs into our C2 profile. So we can execute that directly over here by typing either seed belt, it will execute seed belt into a target process and give me a response back. If I type monologue and you can see over here that the seed belt is getting executed into a target process that is this process or I can type just monologue and I can execute the uh, .NET monologue that's internal monologue code into my own process without spawning anything new and giving you a response back while still patching ETW and AMSI in this case. Similarly, if you want to, let's say, for example, do something else like DNS enumeration. So almost uh, tons and tons of tools, including a lot of your uh, BOFs from trusted sec are already added internally as internal APIs of Brutal itself so that it is not allocating any separate region that your BOF would do. And it gets allocated as a function within Brutal itself. So there are tons and tons of BOFs that are already integrated within Brutal. Now, a lot of times where your lateral movement techniques like can be useful is for example, the PS exec option that we have. So if I want to move laterally, let's say I have this domain controller, right? So if I type DC enum, it should give me the information about my domain controller over here. As you can see, I can also right click open up, let's say the LDAP Sentinel and I can start enumerating the processes, uh, the uh, users uh, and uh, um, your uh, groups, uh, GPOs into my current domain environment, either by specifying a custom domain or by directly querying an existing domain itself. So let's see if I want to enumerate all the SPNs, right? I can just click on the play button. It will go ahead and enumerate all the service principal names and give me a response back. If I want to enumerate, let's say all the group recon over there, I can go ahead and enumerate all the groups into my target domain controller and it will give me a response back. Or you can also craft your own LDAP query. For example, something like this over here, object uh, class equals to user and parentheses, you can type name equals to Vendetta that is currently my username and I'll concatenate them with ampersand and I'll hit enter. So to <coughs> try to enumerate the user Vendetta as you can see and will give me a response back of all the LDAP information. So now it is in process to convert all of these queries to something that can be passed out by Bloodhound. That is something that is already there as well over here. Now apart from this, let's say you have enumerated everything. Let's say you used uh, for example Mimikads to perform Kerberos or maybe Rubius or some other tool of your own Kerberos and you got a cracked service ticket, right? Now you want to move laterally using the password that you have. You can use the make token command. So over here, I'll use the make token command that I have. So I'll type make token space network since I want to create a network token. One of the things that I found limited in Cobalt Strike was the ability to create local tokens because there were scenarios where I was stuck in a system where I had access to, I had a folder, a OneDrive folder into my system, which belonged to a different user. And I, I had the password for the different user, but I could not access that OneDrive because the only token that uh, Cobalt Strike created was a network token instead of a local token. So I added that option over here to create a local token with the help of which we can navigate to the different directories of users if you are able to crack the password of different users in that case. So over here I'll type, uh, Network, I want to enumerate the dark vortex dot corp, dark vortex dot corp, administrator, and the password as admin at one, two, three. And now if I type ls, let's say slash slash dark, uh, my DC name, uh, let me just check what was my DC name, I forgot for a bit. Yeah, it's vortex dc dot dark vortex dot corp. So let me copy this. If I type ls slash 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 e dollar slash. I should be able to enumerate the target system. And since I'm able to enumerate that, I can use the PS exec command, which basically simply takes, it's a quick lateral movement technique, but simply takes the host name and a payload uh, configuration name. So I have a payload configuration of SMB over here under the name main underscore SMB. So if I just type this and if I hit enter, what my C2 will do is that it will create, a, it will use the shell code of the SMB payload, convert that to a EXE, or first get that a bit, uh, create it depending upon the configuration that I have specified it to be over here. As you can see, the service name over here is transaction broker service. And this would be the name of that service that gets spawned into the target process. We can configure that by going here and selecting the PS exec config and specifying the service name and description if required. And once you've done that, you would be able to move laterally and connect to the name pipe into the target system itself. If you don't want to automate this whole process, you can also do that manually if you want to, let's say, change an existing service configuration, you can use the SC divert command. And all of these are happening using RPC queries over Windows API itself. 
So yeah, as you can see, our service was created. This was done using the sc create command, which is nothing but a, an RPC query of Windows with the help of which the service is created. And now this named pipe should have been created into my target system. So if I type word SMB and instead of this, if I type vortex DC over here, as you can see, I have connection or uh, to my target system as anti system authority. So I can simply go here to my target system. I can take a look at the user privileges that I have using the user info command. If I want to add a new privilege, for example, I can see that my load driver privilege is disabled, right? I can type add priv space se load driver privilege. I will be able to add that user's privilege over here to my current user. And you can see that the privilege would have been added as you can see over here. If I want to perform mimic ads or if I want to perform, let's say DC sync in this case, I can type DC sync. It will DC sync every other user that is currently there. If you want to specify a single user, you can do that as well. You can execute mimic ads over here, something like this colon colon debug double quotes secure LSA colon colon log on passwords and we'll go ahead and dump everything for you. You can also take screenshots if you require of the target system. As you can see, if you take a screenshot, you can go to the downloads portion, right click view download and you would be able to see the whole screenshot that you had taken of the target system itself. You can also there's also a few more techniques within brute detail. I probably think that it would be a lot to go right now because it's probably uh, more than 120 commands, but there are uh, sharp inline commands to execute uh, to execute your C sharp process inline. You have the sharp reflect command to execute into the target process, the PS reflect command and the PS import command. We also have the shadow cloak command and the shadow clone command that we have, which will simply dump memory dumps into two different using two different techniques. One is using the PSS capture snapshot and the other one is by directly reading the LSAS memory and download and uh, creating the dump offline uh, instead of dumping it on disk because it does not call mini dump write dump but directly reads specific portions of uh, LSAS and directly downloads the memory offline itself. So, so that's basically a quick overview as to how you can use Brute Retail for a lot of red team activities which I've been using since past a couple of uh, engagements that I have been in. So. Yep, I think that would be um, a quick overview from my end. There are tons and tons of more things. I mean, uh, if you have any queries on that, you can always ping me up uh, personally and I'll be more than happy to assist you. So yeah. any doubts, any queries? Yeah. No, that's pretty cool. You actually a lot of cool feature built in. I'm really interested in seeing how does it actually work under the hood. But yeah, definitely uh, some really interesting feature in there. Uh, thanks, Charles. Thanks. I mean... I, I'm happy to hear that. Any other questions? Anyone? I mean, I will be more than happy to assist in that case. Uh, someone mentioned for monologue, you'll need .NET to be uh, in the machine. If there's no .NET, is there any alternative? Uh, that's a good question. So what Brutetail does by default is that it will try to check for .NET v4, .NET uh, v5, .NET uh, v3, and .NET v2. v2. So if none of them exist, then obviously it won't be able to execute in that case. But you would need at least either of this to execute because you need the CLR DLLs to be present onto the system without which you won't be able to load or execute any C sharp code without that. Even PowerShell requires that. And I think most of the systems do have CLRs because in order to run PowerShell itself, you need the .NET v2 or .NET v4 to be present. And every uh, updated system will have that present in the current scenario. They might not have v2, but they will always have v4. 4, 4.5 or uh, the 5 version in that case. And Brutal is compatible with all the versions, including the 6 version as well, which came recently. Got it. So, yeah, I'll just stop the recording now to make sure that we don't lose it. But we ah, can sure. still uh, ask questions. Thanks again for, our, for uh, taking the time to present it. It was really interesting, that's for sure.